أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير حديث كتاب الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمر مهتداتها وكل مهتدات بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome brothers and sisters to this very special uh, series of lectures on uh, Ramadan and fasting therein type, uh, entitled uh, Welcoming Ramadan 1445 of Hijri. Uh, my name is uh, Ustad Abu Basim, for those of you who do not know me. And um, first of all, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity to discuss his deen. Uh, and we ask Allah to place this in our deeds of, on, on, our, on the scale of good deeds on the day, day of judgment. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us together as he has gathered us here in his highest levels of Jannah. Tai. So, we are pretty much in the end of Rajab now. This is uh, today's what, 29th Rajab uh, in Saudi, so I'm not sure. Maybe something similar in your part of the world. So, we're almost entering Ramadan because we just have one more month in the middle, which is uh, what? Shaban. Uh, so, it makes sense now to discuss uh, this month of Ramadan and regarding fasting. So that's the reason I wanted to do these series uh, of, of lectures. Before we start, some ground rules. Uh, please pay attention as much as possible here. I know sometimes it can be difficult, especially when you're on Zoom and virtual rooms. Um, if you want to make notes, it's up to you. You can make notes. You can take screenshots uh, of my slides. It's, it's okay. No problem, inshallah. Uh, for the sisters joining, please... Um, Post your questions in the chat box anytime. No problem, inshallah. This, these are recorded, so uh, I will know what question was posted. Uh, but we'll try to have a Q&A session towards the end wherein we will answer all the questions, yeah? For the brothers, you can do the same or you can raise your hands during the Q&A session. Um, if you want to interrupt the class, uh, please feel free to do so, but only if uh, I make a mistake somewhere. You think if you think I made a mistake, and you want that corrected, or if you think uh, you want to repeat something, yeah, you want me to repeat something, uh, you can always raise your hands or mention that in the chat box. So, otherwise, uh, please refrain from unmuting your mics or cameras unless I give you the opportunity to do so, because otherwise it disturbs the whole class, right? So we have some, you know, strict rules for those of you who know me, uh, but all this is in the interest of seeking uh, the knowledge of the team, right? It's nothing personal, it's nothing, uh, but we just want everyone to benefit now uh, and me to be able to say what Allah decreed for me to say and for you to listen and, and inshallah all of us benefit from each other now. So for the timings of these series, because it's not going to be only today, because it's it's a huge uh, topic as we will see inshallah in the agenda so uh, we're going to do it every Yom as Sabt which is Saturday 8.30pm uh, Saudi time that's approximately 9.30 in UAE Oman uh, 5.30 I think in the UK and in Ghana I suppose and 6.30 in Nigeria I hope I'm right on this inshallah 10.30 uh, in Pakistan and 11 uh, in India I know it's a bit late in, in, uh, in Pakistan and in India but yeah, I cannot please everybody. So, you know, first of all, my time is, is what is important. And then uh, we try to accommodate the brothers and sisters as much as possible. And if you miss something, you can always go back to the recordings, inshallah. Uh, the recordings will be available on my YouTube channel. That's the channel. Uh, you can just search for at Islam for us. You will find it, inshallah. Uh, you will also find uh, a lot of lectures we did earlier, inshallah, beneficial lectures uh, on the channel in different playlists. Uh, I also have a presence on Telegram. That's my uh, Telegram channel. I also have a question and answer group on Telegram. That's that. And also a lectures group on Telegram. And that's that. 
Um, and all these recordings, invitations are posted on the lectures group as well. If you have any questions, uh, even outside of Ramadan or fasting, you can post it on the Q&A group. Uh, and if you want to contact me directly, that's my direct uh, handle. Taib, uh, if you don't have you, if you don't use Telegram, you can uh, use uh, my groups or lectures groups and Q and A group on WhatsApp. So that's the lectures group on WhatsApp, and that's the Q and A group on on WhatsApp. Taib, barakla pikum. Okay. Taib. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> so before we start this series, the special series, uh, we need to understand the hukum of the ruling in Islam on sending salah and salams on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why is this important? Because this is uh, we are discussing the deen, right? We're discussing the deen of Allah. This is a part of our, our Islam, fasting and Ramadan and so on, and more importantly, we got this deen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So throughout the series, you will find me mentioning many times, sorry, many times, uh, the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will say Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will say Muhammad ibn Abdullah or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever, yeah. But he will be referenced many times through the series, through the hadith and so on and so forth. So what is the ruling? If you're listening to me, right? If you're listening and I'm speaking, and I mentioned his name, what is the ruling upon you as a listener, right? The first time, the first time in any halakha or any session, like for example, today, we're going to have this lecture, maybe one hour or so, inshallah. So the first time you hear his name, it is obligatory. It is wajib, it is farud, it is mandatory that you send salah and salams upon him. So you can say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad in the whole dua if you wish. You can Whatever is easy for you. But you have to do it. It's an obligation. The first time. Every subsequent time, every next time you hear it in the same session, in the same one hour or so, the same class, it is highly, highly recommended. Highly mustahab, as we say in the Arabic language. Highly recommended. Why? Because of the hadith again of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hadith could see that whoever sends salah and salams upon him on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah will reply back with 10 for you. So you as a listener, if you send salah and salams upon him once, you get back 10 in your favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a great investment. 10 for 1, yeah? No bank will give you this kind of a return. So it's important to understand this before we start. Now, and I wanted to implement it, obviously, yeah? not just to listen and understand, but to actually say this when, when we uh, mention his name, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, because it's the deen, and apart from the Quran, the second most important reference for us is the Sahih Sunnah, the Hadith. So I'll find, you'll find me mentioning many times Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, Bukhari and Muslim are amongst the scholars, any scholar, any matab you take, the most Yani, uh, authentic books on on uh, on this matter on the deen. Right? Uh, if someone says there's a question on the chat box, says Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do we have to say after him to to and is it only, we just mentioned that brother Rinon. So when I said Pro, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you have to send salah and salams upon him. That's what the first point means. Is it clear? Brother Reno, is it clear? Right. And brothers, a point I want to mention, uh, okay, maybe this time, you know, the first time a mistake is allowed, yeah. But for me, specifically for me in my classes, uh, do not write S-A-W or P-B-U-H because this is a dua. When we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a dua, we're making a dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to send his salah and salams upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it's a dua. So uh, writing S A W or P B U H or uh, similar abbreviations is not appropriate. Barakallahu feek, Jazakallahu khair. So when we mention uh, this source of the Deen, Bukhari and Muslim, so you'll find me mentioning many times in this series Bukhari or Muslim, 
right? It always refers to Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Because Imam Bukhari, Rahimullah, he wrote many books, right? He also had many collections of hadith. The, but the one which, which is most important, what we refer to is the Sahih Bukhari. He also other, had other hadith collections, which are just, uh, you know, which, have, which had some weak hadith, also known as Bukhari. So don't, you should, you should be very careful, right? When, when I'm in, in this series, in all my classes, inshallah, whenever I refer to Bukhari and Muslim, I'm always referring to the authentic books, uh, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih uh, Muslim. Right? Finally, I may mention sometimes this word, Mutafakun Alay. Mutafakun Alay means, especially in terms of the hadith, when we, when we talk about a particular hadith, nah, when we say Mutafakun Alay, we mean uh, the hadith is mentioned both in Sahih Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim with the same chain with the same sanad, because the hadith has two parts. One is the matan, the text, and the other part is the, the sanad, or the isnad, which is a chain, you know, from Rasulullah Sallallahu to Abu Huraira, from Abu Huraira to uh, Abu Salama, and so on and so forth, for example, yeah? That's a chain. So this hadith is so authentic. It is the one of the highest classes of authenticity that both Bukhari and Muslim collected in their sahih, and it has the same chain. So it is highly, 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 highly authentic. And there are many ahadith like this, right? Fine. So brothers and sisters, uh, knowledge, ilm, right? So you must be wondering why is Ustad doing this subject? Okay, Ramadan is coming. I fast Ramadan every year. What's the big deal? I'm 20, I'm 30, I'm 40 years old, whatever. I have seen so many Ramadans. I'm fasting every year, alhamdulillah. So why should I attend these classes? Why should I even bother, you know, knowing this knowledge and so on and so forth? Brothers and sisters, knowledge in Islam, ilm, ilm, uh, there, is, there are aspects of this ilm which are fard, obligatory. And there are aspects of this ilm which are uh, mustahab, good, good to know, right? Recommended to know, right? So the knowledge which is an obligation of each and every one of us, right, uh, is, is called fard. Yeah? It's basically fard. Knowledge, when you say obligation, is fard. So there's ilm, knowledge, which is fard. And this fard category has two subcategories, fard ayn and fard kifar. Fard ayn is knowledge which is obligatory on each and every Muslim and Muslimah, without an exception. Fard ayn is knowledge which is obligatory on each and every Muslim and Muslimah without an exception. Examples of this knowledge, which you and I should have, should have, no excuse. The first and the most important is about, about our Creator. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should know who is Allah. We should know His uh, His Tawheed, His Rububiyah, His Uluhiyah, His Sifat, and so on and so forth. Now, also another example of knowledge which is far the eye are the pillars of Islam, acts of worship. So we can't come on the day of judgment and, and claim that we did not know how, know how to make wudu. Or I didn't know how to pray salah correctly. Or I'm sorry, Allah, I didn't know how to fast. This is knowledge which is far the eye. Obligation on each and every Muslim. And amongst the pillars of Islam, as we know, is so Ramadan is fasting in the month of Ramadan. So this knowledge which we are trying to discuss in this series, in this series inshallah, is knowledge which is far the eye. There is no excuse for not knowing. There is no excuse for ignorance. There is no excuse for being jahil in terms of this aspect of the deen. This knowledge which I'm trying to give you and we're all trying to learn inshallah is knowledge which is Fard Ayn. Obligation on each and every Muslim and Muslim. You also have knowledge which is Fard Kifai. It's an obligation, yes, but a communal obligation. Which means if some Muslims do it, the others in that same area or, or town or city or, or whatever locality are uh, excused from any sin. But some Muslims should do it, should do it. It's, it's still Fard. It's still obligation. But you see the difference between the first and the second subcategories. 
for the ayn on each and every person obligation. I cannot pray for you. You cannot pray for me. I have to do my own salah. You have to do your own salah. I have to do my own fasting. You have to do your own fasting. It's an obligation each and every one of us. But for kifaya, if I do it, it is enough. You don't have to do it. If you're living with me in the same you know, city, neighborhood, locality, whatever. Example, uh, janaza, for example, if somebody dies, a Muslim brother, brother or sister, a group of Muslims should make ghusl for this person. They should uh, bury him. They should pray salat of janaza over him. The whole city doesn't have to do it. If they do it, it's fine. If they're available and, 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 and uh, you know, available and, and, and being there. But it's not required from everybody. But somebody has to do it. Adhan. Adhan. The Muaddin has to call the Adhan. Somebody has to do it in a particular area where the masjid is. Each and every Muslim does not have to go and call the Adhan. You see the difference, brothers and sisters. So, this knowledge which we are trying to learn, fasting and the month of Ramadan and so on, inshallah, is for the ayin. So it's very important that we get this right now because it is for the ayin. So my title of this uh, series was Welcoming Ramadan. So again, you may wonder what's to welcome and why should I welcome it? Yeah, Usually I welcome some guest in my house, for example, or I welcome a visitor in my office, for example. Yeah. So what's how how is it that we're welcoming Ramadan? Taib? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Khalik, He is the one who creates. He creates everything. Everything, including our actions. If you know, uh, if you understand the Qadr in the right manner, this is one of the principles of Qadr. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Khalik, is the creator of the Al Alameen, everything which exists. The earth and the and the heavens and the and the Jannah and the Nar and the humans and the air, jinn and the insects and the animals and the wind and the clouds, everything. And from this creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chooses as he wishes. Nobody can question him. It is he who questions us. It is he who questions us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, made all the days equal, but he chose Yom al -Jumah to be special as a day of Eid for the Muslims. Now, he created mankind, each and every from Adam al Islam to the last person, you know, even beyond us in the future, who will set foot on earth, last person who will come, who will be born on this earth. Everybody was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from among, among them, he chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be special. Al-Mustafa, the chosen one. Likewise, he created all nights to be equal. And from that, he chose Laylat al-Qadr to be special. Right? Likewise, the months have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is mentioned also in the ayat in Surah Tawbah. We'll see this, inshallah. And he chose Ramadan to be blessed and special. Special in what way, brothers? Yom al uh, Rajab, for example, uh, Ramadan, Laylatul Qadr, huh? special in what way? Well, it's like any other month, right? If you look at it, Ramadan, the sun rises, the sun sets. Huh? It's either hot or cold, depending on the summer or winter. Like any other day, any other month. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be anything visibly different. When you, when you look at the at the month uh, from, a, from a visible uh, perspective, there is no difference. Ramadan is same as uh, Shawwal or Rajab or the Muharram or the Qal. It's the same. Days and nights alternate. The sun rises and the sun sets. The moon rises and the moon sets. It is dark and it is light. So what's what's the difference? Well, how is it special? Why are we saying it's special? Because of the deeds which we do in this month. Uh, so this, even the speciality and, and the blessedness of the month is for us. Allah Akbar. That you do the, the good deeds and the rewards are multiplied many fold. And likewise, the sins are also multiplied in the terms of sayyat many four. So it is Allah, up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he chooses as he, was, as he wishes, sorry. If you're expecting an important guest to come to your house, right? So let's say you, 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 you have your, I don't know, your boss visiting you. Hmm? 
you invite your manager to your house for for dinner now uh, and assuming he's a muslim of course inshallah and uh, you know obviously you want to go out of the way to make sure everything is right because let's say you know the performance bonus is going to come up end of the year and maybe you want to butter him a little bit this is an example yeah it could be your your mother in law visiting you it could be your father in law visiting you it could be um anyone your business acquaintance someone whom you want to impress right so you want everything to be perfect the the room temperature right from the room temperature to the the cushions uh, the cleanliness in the room uh, the food uh, everything should be perfect nothing should be left to chance you go through it you know as a rehearsal you make sure everything you speak to your uh, spouse or the maid who cooks the food to make sure everything is right you go buy whatever is missing the water or the juice the drinks and whatever you make sure everything is ready before he comes in not after he comes in uh -huh. before before you don't start going and buying the drinks after he's coming and he's waiting for you in the room and you tell him oh sorry i need to go rush out and buy some apple juice can you give me a half an hour i'll just be back no it doesn't look nice it's, it's it's disrespectful to the guest. It's being rude to the guest. So before the guest even enters your house, everything is ready. Everything is ready and checked and double checked. So this guest is Ramadan, brothers. Comes once in a year. You want to make sure everything is ready. That is what we're trying to do in this series. We want to make sure that I and yourself, we are all ready to welcome Ramadan before it comes, not after it comes. Because after it comes, it's too late. You missed the bus. It's too late. Before it comes. That is the purpose of... How do we start off by being ready? By gaining the right knowledge. That's the first step, obviously. So if my boss is coming and I don't know which juice he likes... Maybe he doesn't like apple juice. Maybe he likes mango juice. I need to check that first. I need to have that knowledge first before I can go and buy that particular juice. Because if he doesn't like apple juice and I serve him apple juice, he's going to be upset. So I need to have that knowledge first that my manager, he likes mango, not apple. So likewise, we're trying to get that knowledge in these series. So we are prepared with a smiling face. Ah, with a smiling face. This is important. Yeah? No grudges. No, uh, you know, why Ramadan? You know, I can't eat my food. I can't drink my... No, 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 with a smiling face. You're waiting eagerly. You're looking out. Where's his car? Is his car approaching? Is that his car? He's here. You know, you're waiting. Looking out. With a smiling face. To welcome Ramadan. You see the parallels? between a guest and, and how Ramadan is an important guest because the guest will leave. The manager, after spending an hour with me or two hours, whatever, he will go. That's the only window of opportunity I have with him. Two hours. Within two hours, I have to impress him. If I miss this chance, maybe inshallah he will not accept my invitation again. Maybe, you know, I will not get this bonus, whatever, as an example. So this two hours or three hours is the only window of opportunity that I have. I have to impress him in this two or three hours. If I miss this chance, khalas, I will, I will keep cursing myself. The guest will leave. The guest is not here to stay. He's not a resident. He's a guest. He visits and he leaves. So Ramadan, brothers and sisters, will leave after 29 or 30 days. It will leave. And then you will miss it. So this 29 and 30 days of Ramadan is all that we have. So even if before this, the past year, the previous year, if we have not been good Muslims, we have not been practicing properly, we have not been fasting in the correct manner, there is still an opportunity, inshallah, as long as we are breathing. As long as we are alive and we see Ramadan, we have that opportunity. So that is why we want to welcome the Ramadan in the right manner. By getting the knowledge first and then 
implementing the knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us alive to meet Ramadan and to see it completely, kamil, to fast all the days, inshallah, to make it easy. Because anything can happen, brothers and sisters. Some of us, our friends, relatives, workers, colleagues, whatever, were with us last Ramadan, but they are not here now. They may have passed away. So there is no guarantee. We still have one month. There is no guarantee that we sit here and we say, okay, we will see Ramadan. No. Inshallah. Bismillah. So there is no guarantee. But you want this opportunity. You want it. You want, like how you want your manager to come and get impressed. You want this opportunity. Because this is way beyond. There is no comparison between Ramadan and a manager. Obviously. But I'm just giving an example. Ramadan is far, far superior. The kind of rewards, as we will see, inshallah, the kind of virtues it brings, oh, amazing. Allah Akbar. So you want to be alive, inshallah, to see this Ramadan and to finish fasting the whole month and to do it in the right manner, which Allah is pleased with us. Having said this, there is a common dua which circulates on social media, um, also maybe on email and people recite it, whatever. This is Daif. The hadith which talks about this dua is weak. That's the reference there for you. So it's best not to recite this dua. You can just recite it in your own language, in Arabic or anything else, no problem. Asking Allah to keep you alive to see Ramadan and to fulfill its, its rights and obligations upon you. That's okay. But this specific dua, to mention this, this is... Uh, just avoid it because the hadith is weak. Baraklafiq, right. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the best of generations, because Rasulullah said, sallallahu alayhi wa Karni, that is my generation, is the best. Thumma, then the next generation. And Thumma, then the next. So the generation of the Sahaba, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the best generation ever to walk the face of this earth. From Adam al Islam till the end of time, it is the best of generations, even in the future. And then the Tabai, second. And then the Atba Tabai, the third generation. That's it. Beyond that, Rasulullah did not proceed. He just stopped at the first three generations. These are the best. We call them the Salaf, the pious predecessors. So if you want to learn the deen correctly, look at how the Sahaba implemented the deen. Al-Hafiz ibn Rajah said in this um, saying, which is in Lataif al-Ma'arif, Ma'ala ibn al-Fadl said, they used to pray to Allah for six months, may he be exalted, asking him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to cause them to reach Ramadan. And they used to call upon him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for six months, asking him to accept it from them. Allahu Akbar. So the way of the Sahaba was, six months before Ramadan starts, they would make dua to Allah, asking them to be alive to reach Ramadan and to benefit from it. And after Ramadan, they would continue making dua to Allah to accept for six months, to accept their deeds in Ramadan. Because brothers and sisters, when you do a deed, right, even this series on Zoom, inshallah, we have no idea whether Allah is going to accept it or not. We will know only on the Day of Judgment. But then it's too late. We hope, we do our best, inshallah, and we pray to Allah to accept it. That's all that we can do, humanly possible. Yeah. But there is no guarantee, right? But there are certain conditions we will put in place, and we'll talk about them, for any act of worship to be accepted, including this. If we do it with a class, sincerity, and we do it only with it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is, this is like a pre-introduction, right? Alhamdulillah. But it's important. It's very important to know these points. Uh, the agenda we have uh, for all of us in this series, inshallah, which we will do every Yom as Sabt, every Saturday, we will do an introduction, hopefully starting today, inshallah. We will talk about the aqidah aspects of fasting, and we will see what is aqidah a bit later. We will then move on to the fiqh of fasting, Right? The fiqh matters. How do you actually implement fasting as a Muslim or a Muslimah? We will look at uh, mustahab, highly recommended actions in the month of Ramadan. There are many. 
We will look at also Zakat al-Fitr and Eid because this is in the end of Ramadan. It makes sense to talk about that as well because it's something which is an act of worship, uh, both Zakat al-Fitr and uh, Eid al-Fitr. So we will look at that as well. We will look at matters which specifically pertain to our sisters, the Muslimat, because there are certain areas which uh, apply to them in terms of fasting, in terms of Ramadan and so on and so forth. So that will also be covered, inshallah. We will look at common mistakes Muslims make, certain frequently asked questions and so on. Uh, and these mistakes, you will see, all of us make these mistakes. So uh, we need to you know, know those mistakes and, and rectify ourselves so that we don't fall into that uh, trap. And finally, inshallah, we will have a Q&A session. I, I, this is in the end, so it's after like, I think I'm planning, inshallah, for the series to be maybe five weeks. Yeah, it will go on for five weeks at least. So the whole of Shaban, we will be discussing this every Yom uh, I will try to give you some time. I'm not, I don't promise, but I will try to give you some time every day for Q&A uh, on whatever we covered, uh, because I'm sure your question will be answered. Because if, just by looking at the agenda, I'm going to cover, inshallah, every single thing that you want to know about fasting and Ramadan. Every single thing, inshallah, inshallah. Right? So, inshallah, your question will definitely be, un will be, will be covered somewhere down the agenda, you know, topics. It will be covered. But if it's very urgent, you know, you can ask me and inshallah, we will try to answer it briefly. Uh, but definitely in the end, you will have a Q&A session. Maybe one class separately only for Q&A, inshallah. Uh, we will try to do that. So that's the agenda. As you can see, it's a, it's a very uh, huge and action-packed <laughs> agenda. Yeah. Now, sorry. So for the introduction today, inshallah, bismillah, we will have a sub-agenda as well. So we will look at certain or rather four points below the introduction. Now, if you want to call it 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, whatever. So the definition like we look at certain terms and their definitions. We will look at the ruling, naam, the hukum. We will look at virtues, benefits uh, on, on fasting and of Ramadan itself. Right? So let us start with the definition. And it's ruling, right? Of, of the first two, the one A and one B. In the Arabic language, we call it Asiyah. We call it Asiyah, right? This is the Arabic word uh, which is commonly understood to be fasting yeah? now as with uh, many words in, in because uh, brothers and sisters islam in its final uh, version because when, when i say final version i mean islam as revealed to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because all the prophets were muslims islam was revealed to all of them this was their deen the deen of ibrahim alayhi salam nuh alayhi salam uh, yaqub alayhi salam uh, Everybody, everybody, uh, Isa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, each and every prophet and messenger, their, their deen, what they brought was Islam. Islam. And they were all Muslims. But there were certain change, differences in the Sharia, in, in the do's and don'ts, right? So, when it came in its final form to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, from the same creator who sent it to everybody else, it came in the Arabic language, right? We know this, because the Quraysh in Arabia uh, they spoke Arabic. And uh, this was because Ismail alayhi salam, who was there as, a, as an infant, uh, left alone there with his mother, uh, Hajira, as we know the story. He learned Arabic language from the tribe of Jurhum, from Yemen. This tribe of Jurhum, which came from Yemen, they, they taught him Arabic. That is how Arabic spread into Arabia, right? through Ismail alayhi salam. So, it came in the Arabic language. The Quran is, is in Arabic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his wisdom, took existing words in the Arabic language and gave it a more specific, uh, focused and sharia meaning, if you want to call it that. One such word is siyam. In the language meaning, in the Arabic language meaning, which the Quraysh knew, uh, a siyam means to abstain, to stay away from something, to refrain from something, to avoid something. That is the language meaning, Logat al Arabiya man, language. In the istilah meaning, in the sharia meaning, the technical meaning, it means to stay away or to abstain from things that break the fast from dawn until dusk, having first made the intention to fast. Again, 
It means to stay away from certain things which may break the fast from dawn to sunset or dusk, having first made the niya to fast. So as you can see, brothers and sisters, the meaning doesn't change. But Islam took the Arabic meaning abstain and now gave it a more contextual or more specific context-based meaning specific to fasting and Ramadan, for example. Yeah. Likewise, you have the word Salah. As Salah, I think all of us prayed Salat al Isha today, inshallah, hopefully, depending on where you're joining from. But As Salah in, in, in the Arabic language, it means Dua. It means Dua. Right? That is the language meaning. In the Istilah meaning, it covers everything we say and we do from Takbirat al Ihram until Taslim. And there are other words like the Zakat and so on and so forth. But for now, our, our focus is Siyah. So this is the meaning. So when we fast, we stay away from something. We refrain. We keep away. We avoid. With certain conditions. Dawn to dusk with the intention and so on and so forth. And we'll see all of this inshallah. Not to worry. The word Ramadan itself. Because we're talking about Ramadan obviously. Yeah? This word Ramadan is from the word the scholars say Ramad or Ramadan which uh, signifies or which means intense heat. You know, the, the loo, L -O, the, the intense heat which comes off uh, when you, if you're on a very hot day and especially if you're in the desert or something and if you go near a rock, you can actually feel the heat. Even without touching the rock, you can feel the heat waves coming out. That is Ramad or Ramadan. So Allah, Allah maybe the first time the, the people started using this name for this month, uh, it was probably in the peak of summer, Allahu Alam, because it changes. Yeah, obviously, uh, Ramadan can come in winter, and because now in this part of the world, it's not really winter. Winter is slightly be away, will be off. It's also not summer, so it's between winter and summer. But you know, it keeps advancing as we know. So that's the meaning of the word. That's why that's how that that word came into place. But uh, yeah, sorry. Also, uh, many people in the subcontinent. I don't know about Africa. Because we have some students from Africa today, alhamdulillah, ahlan wa sahlan. Uh, but um, they use this word Ramzan. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, because they're largely Urdu speaking probably, yeah. Uh, but this is, is not the actual word, right? The actual word is Ramadan. It's a dar, it is not a za. So especially when you're talking to an Arab, it gives you completely wrong uh, meaning or, or connotation. So it's best, best to use the word Ramadan, even if you're Urdu speaking and so on. Now, this word, we said that the people, um, uh, you know, when maybe when, it, when, they, when they gave this month the word Ramadan, probably in the peak of summer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how in Surah Tawbah, he mentions, Inna iddat al-shuhurul in the lahit natayni ashar. Shaharan fi kitab illahi, yawma khalaq al-samawati wal-ard, minha arba'atun hurum. Thalikud deen al-qayyum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Tawbah, ayat number 36, meaning of which it says, Verily, the number of months with Allah in the law is 12, it's not Asha, 12 months. So it was ordained, it was, it was written down by Allah, it was ordained by Allah. On the day when he created the heavens and the earth, let's pause this for now. So the ayat says in Surah Tawbah that the number of months in a calendar year in the law with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is how many? Itna to Asha. 12 months. So this 12 months which we follow, and we're talking specifically about the Hijri calendar, brothers and sisters. I'm not even going near the Gregorian calendar because it's full of shirk. Yeah, We don't go there. As Muslims, we refer to the Hijri calendar. So we're looking at the Hijri calendar here. Muharram to the Hijjah. So this 12 months were ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. When? On the day when he created the heavens and the earth, not before you and I were born, on the day when he created the heavens and the earth. So this is something as, as, as a foregone conclusion. These 12 months were already written down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created the heavens and the earth. Minha arbaatun hurum. So from this are four which are sacred. And that is the right deen, deen al qayyim. And the ayat continues. But these four months which are sacred, which is being referred to here, many Muslims think Ramadan is one of them. It's wrong. As we talked on the, on the lecture on, on Rajab, 
It's on my YouTube channel, the month of Rajab. That's the that's one of them, Rajab. And then you have Dhul Qada, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. Ramadan is not a sacred month. It is a blessed month. There is a difference. Because there are certain rules which apply to a sacred month. Ramadan, however, is, is still special, but it is not one of the four sacred months. It's still special. It's blessed. And, and the deeds are multiplied in there as we see in other hadith on this. But the point I wanted to use this hadith, ayat for you to understand is that these months were already ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created the heavens and the earth. Well, now, the ruling of fasting Ramadan. Uh, as Muslims, you know, our deen is Islam, right? And deen, uh, it's not a religion. When you translate it in English language, religion is a wrong translation. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. Because when we say religion, we think of, let's say, for example, the people who go every Sunday to the mass and they say, oh, father, I have sinned. Forgive me. And the father says, you have forgiven my son. Go. The guy goes, makes some more sins, comes back after two weeks or after one month and says, oh, father, I have sinned. And the same thing cycle repeats. So it's very easy in their so-called quote-unquote religion to sin and to have them washed off. No issues. Huh? Or somebody else who goes to a temple and, and bows before an idol. These are religions. Man-made. Twisted out of context and twisted out of the revelations. But what we have, you and I, as Muslims, is a way of life. So from the time we get up in the morning till we go to bed at the night, it's covered in our deen. Every single thing is there in our deen. It's a way of life. So it's not restricted to those four, five salawat and fasting Ramadan. No, it's, it's beyond that. So everything in this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a way of life for us, it makes sense that everything in this way of life has to have a ruling, a hukum in Islam. In Islam, brothers and sisters, there are five ahkam, five rulings. And all of them are derived, as we see in the top, from the Quran and the Sahih Sunnah. I mentioned Sahih because we also have Daif Sunnah. We have Maudu Sunnah, uh, which is fabricated, lies of the Prophet All of this is rejected and neglected. We don't, we don't even look at that, right? We look at the Sahih Sunnah to derive, derive rulings, rulings. So, primarily, the primary uh, sources are two. The Quran, as understood by the Salaf, and the Sahih Sunnah. And from this, as you can see, the second layer there, you have the haram and the halal. It is easy. Haram is prohibited. If you do it, there is a punishment. If you don't do it, because it is haram, inshallah, there is a reward. Halal is what is permissible, what is allowed. Under that, you have Four subcategories. You have the wajib on the right, or which is fard, obligatory, they are the same. Fard and wajib are the same. And this is the correct opinion, inshallah, of uh, the schools of thought of Imam Malik, uh, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Shafi. The Hanaf, they disagree a bit. They say wajib is a bit below fard, but they use linguistic uh, evidences for this, not from the Quran and the Sunnah. So that's, inshallah, a mistake. What is more correct is that the fard and wajib are the same. Than wajib are the same. Then you have mustahab, then you have mubah, and you have makhru. Wajib or fard is obligatory. So if you do it, there is a reward. If you don't do it, there is a punishment. It is opposite of haram. Wajib in fard, if you do it, there is a reward. Salat al fajr in the masjid for the brothers is what? Is wajib, is fard. So if you play Salat al-Fajr, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, there is a punishment. Not from me and your manager, your father, no. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mustahab is highly recommended. If you do it, you're rewarded. If you don't do it, there is no punishment. Muba is in the middle, it's permissible. Uh, if you do it or don't do it, there is no reward or punishment. It's, 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 it's okay. Like having a bath on a hot day, Drinking apple juice instead of mango juice. It's your preference. It's allowed. It's permissible. There's no issues. Makru is the opposite of mustahab. Disliked. Detested. If you don't do it because it's detested, there is a reward. If you do it, there is no punishment. So these are the rulings in brief without getting into details. 
But you need to understand this because everything in our life has a ruling. Anything, using an iPhone instead of an Android, using um, Netflix, watching Netflix, uh, uh, listening to music, um, uh, praying Salat al-Duha, uh, fasting Yom al-Ithnin, Yom al-Khamis, um, uh, drinking with the right hand, drinking with the left hand, eating with the right, eating with the left, uh, entering the masjid with the left foot or with the right foot. Everything has a ruling. Everything has a ruling. That is why Islam is a way of life. If you open the books of Hadith and look at the table of contents, you'll be amazed. Just go to the table of contents in the beginning, the first few pages. You will see the bab, the chapters of so many different things. You'll be amazed. That is why we say it's a way of life. How to buy and sell, how to treat your wife, how to treat your children, huh? how to how to uh, trade, how to travel. What are the rulings on traveling? What are the rulings in battle? What are the rulings on, on the ghanima? What are the rulings with respect to your multiple wives, with slaves? Everything is there. And everything has one of five rulings. Either it is wajib or mustahab. Sorry, wajib or fard. Mustahab, mubah, makru or haram. It has to be one of five. It can't be. There is no sixth. But most importantly, these rulings are derived from where? Not from my own head. No, audhu billah. From the Quran and the Sahih Sunnah. The Quran and the Sahih Sunnah. So fasting the month of Ramadan. Coming back to our topic. Fasting the month of Ramadan. What is the ruling? What is the ruling? We said it's a pillar. All of us know this. Young children are being taught this in schools by their parents and so on and so forth. The pillars are five. Shahadatain, uh, Salah, Zakat, Saum, Hajj. These are the five pillars of Islam. Rasulullah said in the hadith, Al-Buni al islamu ala khams. The building or the structure of Islam, ala khams, is built upon five. He did not say it is the five. He didn't say fi, fi khams. He said ala khams, it's on the five. So these are pillars, brothers, but these are not, this is not Islam. Islam is more than this, as you can see in this picture. It rests on these five pillars. If you take away one pillar, the whole building of Islam collapses. You see? If I'm building a house in, in let's say, some other country or some other state, now, and I, and I assign a contract to the architect and they say, okay, the construction is started. I'm giving them money, but I can't really visit the place because I'm busy. One fine day, the contractor, he says, the house is finished, come and have a look. So I go to the, my, my site and I see there is only the foundation. So I ask him, where is the house? Is this your house? I be a shake. Where is the house? Where are the walls? Where is the, the, the painting, the, the, the finishing, the electrical, the plumbing works? Uh, the, where is all that? He says, no, this is your house. Will I pay the contractor? No. Because he just gave me the foundation. Yes, it's important. Without the foundation, there is no house. But that's just the foundation. Bunyalul Islamu ala khams. So, brothers and sisters, many Muslims think if I pray five times a day and I fast Ramadan and I go for Hajj once in a lifetime and I give zakat here and there, I'm good to go. We hope, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you good to go. But that is not Islam. Islam is beyond this. Open the books of Hadith, the same example I gave you. Go to the table of contents. Will you see only five chapters there? you will see maybe 30, 40 chapters. Not just five chapters. Those five chapters are there in the book, yes. But you will see so many other chapters as well. The book of creation, the book of revelation, the, so many chapters are there. So Islam is beyond. I want you to get this message. That's, that's why I'm, I'm focusing a lot on this. It's beyond this. Again, brothers and sisters, like we said, we all fast. Alhamdulillah, we all, we've all been fasting the previous years. I'm not going to give you anything new which you don't already know. Yeah. Yes, there could be some points I, I kind of clarify, some questions which you may, which can get clarified. But I want to give you uh, some extra uh, messages as well, inshallah. Beneficial, inshallah, messages, inshallah. So the ruling, we are a people of dalil or evidence. Yeah. Islam or the uh, acts of worship, because fasting, fasting is an act of worship, right? Fasting is an act of worship. We all agree. It's a pillar of Islam. It's an act of worship. 
Tawqifi. So it's, this is uh, Islam acts of worship are Tawqifi. They need they're built on evidences. We need evidence from the Sahih, from the correct understanding of the Quran as per Salaf, or the Sahih Sunnah, or both. If there is no evidence, we do not do that act of worship. Again, if there is no authentic evidence for a particular act of worship, we do not do that act of worship. We need evidence. So what is the evidence for fasting? Why should I fast Ramadan? And how do I know it's obligatory? How do I know it's 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 mandatory? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyah. Kama kutiba ala alladhina min kablikum la allakum tattakum. Surah Baqarah ayat number 183. It's part of the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, those who have believed like myself and yourself, inshallah. Kutiba alaykum as Kutiba is from Kataba, something written down, something mandated, something obligatory, something prescribed. Alaykum upon you. What? What is that one mandatory or written down or prescribed upon you? as Fasting. Kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum. As it was mandatory or obligatory on those before you. And why do we fast? لَأَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that we become of the muttaqun. Have taqwa. So from this we know multiple things from this ayat. One, that it is an obligation. Just being a pillar of Islam, that itself is an evidence, but it's an additional evidence. That's an obligation. Kotiba. The second point we know, brothers and sisters, is that this is something, there's not something new which we are doing. The Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it's not the first people who are fasting, no. Fasting was prescribed on those before us. The people of Musa alayhi wa the people of Isa alayhi wa and so on. It's not something new. Taib. And why do we fast? The most important point, why are we fasting? Because my father says so. Because everybody is fasting and I need to fast, otherwise I'll be, you know, embarrassed. Why are we fasting? To gain taqwa. To become of the muttaqun. Taqwa, brothers and sisters, is the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In, 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 uh, in the night and in the day. In public and in private. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One al Khattab radiallahu an, he asked a sahabi, uh, rather the sahabi asked him, Ya Amir Muminin, what is taqwa? What is taqwa? So he asked, he asked the sahabi, how do you cross a pathway or a street where there are a lot of thorns and um, stones or something like this? How do you cross this? So the Sahabi said, uh, Ya Amir al muminin I lift my toe and make sure and be careful where I place my feet so as not to harm myself. So Amir al muminin he said, Radiallahu anh, this is taqwa. This is taqwa. So every single thing which we do, we, we first see what does Islam say about it? How can I please Allah through this by doing this action? How can my intention be, be harless and sincere for the sake of Allah? How can I do this action only in the way of Rasulullah? So you check these things before you do actually that, that deed. And fasting is one of these things which can teach you and train you in taqwa. Because, for example, no matter how good a Muslim, sorry, how bad a Muslim he is, yeah, a Muslim irrespective of his practices and so on and so forth. If he's fasting, right? And let's say he is fasting Ramadan and uh, he's living alone, right? Nobody in his house. What's stopping him from going in the afternoon, in the Ramadan, opening the refrigerator, taking a can of juice and drinking it? He will not do this. Most of them at least, inshallah, hopefully. Large, like, like the aksiriyat of the Muslim population. They will not do this because they fear Allah deep down. And fasting, this, this Ramadan is a training ground. It trains you in taqwa, which you should have anyway for the rest of the 11 months. It's a training period. This one month out of the 12 is a training period. It's training for you. So when you join a new company or a new role is given to you, there's some uh, initial training given to you, right? Maybe a week, maybe a day, maybe 10 days, maybe a month. I don't know. You join the military, you join the army, navy, air force. They give you, there's a training period. 
they, they give you training so that you're skilled and you can do what is expected of you for the rest of the period of your uh, uh, service. So likewise, Ramadan is training the rest of the 11 months. But what do I and you do? I largely, we just focus on Ramadan. We forget the rest of the 11 months. We're back to uh, square one in the 11 months. And again, when Ramadan comes, oh, Ramadan is coming. Let's become uh, religious and pious. We ask Allah to make us from the muttaqun by fasting this month of Ramadan. And this is not only for the men, right? Though usually in the Quran, when a Muslim, this word Muslim comes or a command is addressed, automatically because of the nature of the Arabic language, it includes the Muslimat. They're automatically included. However, there are certain ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies explicitly, like this ayat in Surah Ahzab, the Muslimat. In the Muslimina or Muslimati, or Muminina or Muminati, a beautiful ayat. But the point I want to draw to the attention is Wasaimina or Saimat. So the ones, uh, the men and the women who observe sound fast. And the ayat continues the men and women who guard the chastity and remember Allah much. Huh? Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. Adallahu lahum. Sometimes the sisters, they ask me this question. And though it is a wrong question to ask, why is it Allah mentioning the women in this ayat? First of all, we do not question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a wrong question to ask. We do not question the Quran. We question ourselves. Why didn't I understand this ayat? That's how the question should be rephrased. You see, that's, that's the first point. But some people have asked me these questions. And secondly, to clarify any, you know, uh, what shall we say, misunderstandings, this ad specifies the men and the women specifically, though they're all automatically included. The believers, Allah's going to talk about the ones who are kanita, the, the, the obedient, the truthful, the patient, sabirun, the humble, the ones who give sadaqat, the ones who fast, who guard the chastity, and who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and each one of us requests forgiveness, brothers and sisters. All of us commit sins. We all need the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a great reward, al-Jannah. So, obedience is for both. Truthfulness is for both. Patience is required of both. Humbleness is required from both. Sadaqah and zakat is required from both. Asiyam is required from both. Guarding of the chastity, ah, Many brothers think only the women should guard their chastity and the only when the women should look down and cover up. No, even the men. There is hijab for men as well. Puru jahum. There is men, there is, there is guarding of the chastity for both and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for both. So very beautiful ayat to always go back to and, and, and look at all what is expected from us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Muslim or a Muslim. And what is the end result? If you do all of that, forgiveness. Allah Akbar. So we're still looking at evidences for the rulings. So we saw it as mandatory on both Muslims and Muslimat. Now, this other hadith in, in uh, Ahmad and Nasai and uh, Sahiba Sheikh Al-Albani. Sorry, I forgot to mention Sheikh Al-Albani uh, before we talked about Bukhari, Muslim and so on. Sheikh Al-Albani is, is, is a scholar of hadith. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard of him. Uh, a more contemporary scholar. And uh, he did great work. May Allah have uh, mercy, mercy upon him and grant him the highest levels of Jannah in the field of hadith. Na? So this is graded sahih by, by uh, Sheikh Al-Albani. That the hadith of Rasulullah, the meaning of which is, there has come to you Ramadan, a blessed month, which Allah has enjoined you to fast. So when enjoined, again, the same as kataba, mandatory, obligatory. In it, the gates of paradise are opened up and the gates of hellfire are closed. And the shayateen are chained up. In it, there is a night that is better than a thousand months. Whoever is deprived of its goodness is indeed deprived. The hadith has different uh, yani, aspects to it. 
And for us, we, we just focused on the enjoining part currently. We're going to look at the other parts of the hadith as we go through uh, this series, inshallah, of course. But uh, for now, this is another supporting evidence that fasting Ramadan is, is obligatory. And, and the gates of Jannah are opened up, the gates of Hilfah are closed. Uh, how many gates to Jannah? Uh, okay, first question for all of you. How many gates to Jannah? Does anyone know? Naam. Okay, eight. Naam, someone says eight. Sorry. Sorry. Naam, naam. Now, the correct answer, Jazak Mala is eight. Eight. Eight gates to Jannah. And to hellfire, we have seven. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy has put an extra gate to Jannah. He wants more people to enter Jannah. So eight for Jannah and seven for hellfire. And the gates of Jannah are opened up, which means it is a, it is, it is a, a method or a, or a way or, or a channel to enter this month of Ramadan, fasting this month. And the gates of hellfire are closed. We'll come back to this hadith later on, inshallah. An important note to, uh, to keep in mind about someone who denies the obligation of fasting. Because it's a pillar of Islam, because it, we've clearly seen some evidences, there are many others, that it is obligatory. Taib, huh? if someone says, no, I don't believe, Allah, that it is obligation, this person is outside the fold of Islam. He's left Islam. If he's interested to come back, he needs to share the shahadatin again. He's left us now. If he denies the obligation. If someone does not deny the obligation, he knows it's obligatory, but he is lazy or whatever, he doesn't fast the month of Ramadan. This person is committing a kabira. He's committing a major sin. And major sins carry with them the punishment of hellfire. Major sins require specific tawbah from Allah subhanahu, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Specifically, you have to explicitly seek the repentance of Allah for it to be forgiven. Otherwise, it's not forgiven. It carries the punishment of hellfire. But I just wanted to understand the difference between the two. Anyone who says it is not obligation, not, not an obligation, this person has left Islam. Anyone who believes it's obligatory, but is not fasting. For whatever X, Y, Z reasons, non-Sharia reasons, non-Sharia reasons, because Sharia uh, gives you certain exceptions. We will see that in the fiqh. But this is non-Sharia reasons. For this, we say this guy uh, is, is committing a major sin. Apart from fasting, all of us, when we talk, talk about Ramadan, automatically our mind goes to fasting, right? Which is good. This month is also the month of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah again says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيَّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرِ فَالْيَسُمْ So in Surah Baqarah, Ayat 185, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is the month of Ramadan, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي in which we have sent down or I have revealed what the Qur'an, the Qur'an. And what is the Quran? It's a guidance for the mankind, for mankind. And it's a clear proof of that guidance. And well, Furqan. It's, it's a criteria or a standard. And for those who witness this month, those who are alive to see this month of Ramadan, you should fast. You should fast. So this is another evidence from Surah Baqarah that fasting is mandatory for whoever is alive to see Ramadan. But for us, we want to go to the first part of the ayat, which is the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is the month of the Quran. Or rather, what I want, sorry, what I, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in, what, in which was sent down the Quran. The Quran was sent down in this month. Now I want to pause and ask all of you a question regarding the revelation of the Quran, right? So Allah here in the Quran, and we know the Quran cannot, audhu be, be wrong. Allah says that I have sent down the Quran in this month, in this blessed month of Ramadan. Right? Okay. We also know when we study the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the Quran came down to him over a period of 23 years from the moment he received Jibreel 
alayhi salam in the cave, iqara, until he passed away. 23 years of prophethood. Bits and pieces of the Quran in different ayat and different surahs came down across this period of 23 years. But here Allah says, I have revealed the Quran in the month of Ramadan. So how do we reconcile these two? Because both are sahih. The ayat is sahih and the seerat and the hadith are also sahih. So how do we bring them together? How do we understand this? This is a very important question to know and you know to have the answer to. And I will tell you why once we discuss the answer. Anyone? Anyone? You get the question, right? The ayat says that the Quran was revealed in this month of Ramadan. And the hadith and the hadith and sirat tells us it was revealed over a period of 23 years. Okay, so someone says, Zakallah khair, uh, in the month of Ramadan, revealed to the lowest heaven. Okay. And uh, so now the next point is, what is the revelation in the sirat talking about? From where and, and how and to whom? So the first part is right. The ayat is talking about because see, brothers and sisters, we have seven heavens, right? One above the other. Okay, again, the other point I wanted to mention, which I forget to mention initially, is that when I say heavens, I mean samawat, seven heavens. When I say jannah, I mean paradise. Right? So th these are two different entities. Jannah and paradise is something else already created and inshallah we expect to be there, hopefully. And the heavens are the seven heavens, one above the other. Our earth and everything that we see, our stars and everything, are part of the lowest heaven. Lowest heaven. Like this, there are seven, six other heavens above them. And above the first heaven is the is, is the water, and then is the footstool, kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Azza So, Someone rightly said, this ayat is talking about the revelation of the Quran to the lowest heaven. From where? From the Lohe Mahfuz. Lohe Mahfuz is a sealed tablet or, or sealed book to the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he charted the creation, he first created the pen. And then he asked the pen, the kalam, to write. The pen asked, what should I write to Allah? And Allah asked it to write everything which happens from that point till the end of time, till Jannah and Nar and everything which happens in Jannah and Nar. Everything is written in this book, Lohe Mahfuz. So the Quran is also in this book. You and I are also in this book. So in the month of Ramadan, Shahru Ramadan, Allah revealed the Quran from this book to the lowest heaven to honor the Quran. But the second part is what I want is most important to understand. This 23 years, so someone says, a revelation to our Prophet over period 23 Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, but from where or from whom? That's the important point I want to, want to clarify. Yes, it was revealed over period 23 years from, uh, from uh, yeah, through Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam, Naam, Naam, through Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sallam, correct. But from what, what is the source? Is it the Quran in the lowest heaven? Because the Quran was already there in the lowest heaven. Now, Wahi, okay, Wahi is, is revelation, that's fine. But the source, what is the source? Naam, Naam, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes. This is important to because many Muslims think it is from the lowest heaven. So they think it came from the lowest heaven to Rasulullah. No, this is wrong. The Quran was revealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu by, by Jibril Alayhi Salam from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala himself. So Allah spoke those words and Jibril brought it down Alayhi Salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over a period of 23 years. Because there was a group of Muslims who deviate, deviated the Mu'tazila, for example, because they said the Quran was created. It is a creation of Allah, which is wrong. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And if you think it came from the lowest heaven as, as a book, because the book is already there in the lowest heaven. If you think it came from there, you will think it is created. It is wrong. The kind of understanding is that it came again from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel over a period of 
ట్వంటీ త్రీ ఇయర్స్ టు రసూలుల్లా సల్లుల్లాహు అలహి వసల్ క్లియర్ బరక్ లఫీక్ నామ్ తయ్ Apart from bringing the month of fasting and the month of the Quran, and all of us, alhamdulillah, we read Surah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ramadan, and you know, sometimes we just uh, recite the Quran in, only in Ramadan. This is the problem. Yeah? So I want to just spend a few minutes on this, if you don't mind. Uh, many of us take the, before Ramadan, let's say Ramadan is tomorrow, we take out the mushaf from the shelf, it's gathering dust. We clean up the dust. We open up the nice uh, velvet, silky cloth. and we start using the quran or reciting al mushaf in ramadan very uh, religiously very diligently very mashallah you know uh, maybe two times three times in the month mashallah fantastic once quran uh, eid comes we close the book put it back where it was wrap it up and put it back where it was to gather the dust again till the next ramadan or we take it out when somebody gets married or somebody dies and recite it subhanallah this was not the reason for revelation brothers and sisters if this was the reason for revelation uh, honestly you and i would not be muslim the sahaba would not be the way they were the quran was revealed the purpose of the revelation of 23 years why to address context to address situations to answer questions and for us to implement it and show the sahaba the quran has to affect your heart if it doesn't affect your heart and it is just on the tongue it is of no use absolutely no use yes you may get rewarded ali alif wa harf wa lam wa harf wa mim wa harf the hadith of rasulullah says you may get the reward but you want to improve as a muslim right don't you don't you want to improve as muslims or do we just want the reward and even the reward is dependent on action so we want our, uh, you want we want ramadan we want fasting we want the quran to change us that was that was the purpose of revelation not to be hung on a wall right so uh we we have to we have to at least take this opportunity i'm not saying you don't have to recite the quran you have to recite you have to read it but along with this you need you need to also understand the meaning understand especially for non arabic even for arabic speakers because the word can have a specific meaning in a specific ayat so understand the context understand the meaning understand what is allah speaking to you as the as the salaf would say when allah says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu pay attention to what follows because allah is speaking to you so we need to use this month the month of the quran to implement the quran in our lives too, and at least to start understanding it make they make take the first step yeah that's the point it is also the month of many battles jihad fi sabil allah battle of badr the fighting al furqan the, the deciding battle in islamic history happened in the second year of hijra in ramadan 17th of ramadan at the makkah the the conquest of makkah one of the greatest milestones huh rasulullah sallam destroyed all the idols and he forgave many of the quraish except a few happened happened in ramadan the battle of tabuk the following year also had happened in ramadan the battle of the against the goths the godilath battle also happened in ramadan in 92 hijri year He seen the famous battle of Salahuddin Ayyubi Palestine happened in 584 Hijri so Muslims actually fought while fasting and subhanallah today we have Muslims who are sitting in the comfort of their houses on their couches huh? and they break their fast for the flim- flimsiest and and most silliest of excuses a small headache why oh, can't fast Oh, uh, my son has exams tomorrow so he can't fast these are not valid reasons brothers and sisters as we will see inshallah in the fiqh accept aspect sorry also ayn jalut sorry ayn jalut against the the, the the mongols if you know the mongols they they had they caused great destruction uh, amongst the muslims rape pillory you know uh, torture oppression uh, burning of books uh, it was it was unheard of and this was the deciding battle against the ain jalut where they defeated and then after this their decline started now time uh we will stop with this if you don't mind we have not we not yet finished the introduction so as you can see there's lot lots to cover and we are going to go into lots of details but uh we will stop for now we will continue inshallah next week 
uh, with the virtues and benefits and then start with the aqidah aspects of, of fasting. Um, if you have any quick questions, I saw some questions popping up on the chat box. So just give me a minute. Someone says regarding the creation, the skies and the... No, there's a difference of opinion amongst the, what was created first. But most scholars agree that it was the the, the arsh, of course, the arsh and then the pen uh, before the water and the and the skies. Now, nah. Allahu Alam. Uh, Ustad, but the Quran is also mentioned in Goham Mahfuz, right? It means it is also creation of Allah. Tay, uh, the Quran. Okay, let me clarify this. Someone says, it, like I said, the Quran is in Loh Mahfuz. It was written down in the Loh Mahfuz and taken from there and revealed down to the lowest heaven. As, as, as a mark of honor, as a, as a revelation. But the Quran which you and I recite, right? When we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Or when we say Iqra, for example. Iqra, the first word which is revealed, Iqra. Ma'am, how did this happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke this word Iqra to Jibreel, commanding him to bring it down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the cave, when he was sitting there contemplating upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he mentioned this to, 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 to uh, Rasulullah and said, Iqra. That is how we got Iqra. Clear? So when we say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah spoke this kalima to Jibreel, commanding him to bring it down to Rasulullah along with the whole uh, uh, surah, actually, because Surah Fatiha was the uh, surah which was revealed completely, Kamil. So completely it was brought down by Jibreel to Rasulullah Sallallahu and revealed to him. Clear? Is it clear, uh, the one who asked me this question on the chat box? So when we say Quran, we mean it is the uncreated speech of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That is what we are reciting. But the Mus'haf which you see in the Quran, in the Masajids, this of course is created in a printing press. Yeah, that's that's understood. Papers, pen, and the book, and everything. That's, that's a creation which a man has created uh, in the printing press. But the 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 what the words we speak, which we recite in, in salah or in, in, in rukya, this is the uncreated speech of Allah Subhanahu. Now, Sahib, uh, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam wa gatahu. Please, can someone read from Quran? Why in Nawafil or is it prohibited? Okay, brother uh, Odepi, is that your name? I hope I got your name right. Odepi Mashud. Are you asking me about uh, reading from the Mus'haf in Salah? If that is the question, we're going to cover it, inshallah. We're going to cover it. See, this question, I want you to wait because it's not very urgent. It's not very, uh, we don't have Taraweeh today, right? So I want you to wait. Inshallah, we're going to talk about it in, in the in the, uh, in the the Fiqh or, or in the Mustahab actions. We're going to discuss this, inshallah. So please wait for that, if you don't mind, and then we'll discuss this. At that point, inshallah. Tai, any other questions? Okay, so I think we are done for today. Fasting in Sha'aban. Um, okay. Um, did I have this covered? Is what I'm trying to think. Okay, let, let me mention uh, someone is asking about fasting in the month of Sha'aban. Um, I, I don't remember now, but I think we're going to discuss at some point, probably, Allah Alam. I don't remember right now. But anyway, I will address it briefly because we have Shaban uh, coming in. Uh, so we have the Hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha, umun mumineen, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, did not fast uh, as much in Ramadan as he fasted in Shaban. So it's supposed to be highly recommended. However, however, to single out Nisf Shaban, the middle of Shaban, as, as, uh, um, as a day of fasting, for, uh, you know, the Qadr or something, they call it, right? In, in the night of the Qadr or something. This is, is wrong. This is wrong. This is this is a bid'ah. This is an innovation. Likewise, Rasulullah has prescribed, if, if somebody is fasting regularly, right? So if I'm fasting the whole year, Yom al-Yatnin, Yom al-Khamis, or the middle of the month, Ayam al uh, I continue fasting in Shaban, as well, no problem, inshallah. Right? Uh, however, he, 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 he recommended or he advised us not to fast towards the end of Shaba, so as we don't confuse it with Ramadan, and to save our energy for Ramadan, because fasting in Shaban is nothing, nothing, nothing fasting, but Ramadan is something which is mandatory. So you don't want to exhaust your energy uh, in by fasting Shaban, and then you'll have become weak in Ramadan. That's one reason. Second reason, 
not to confuse the start of Ramadan. So avoid fasting the last few days of Shabbat. If you're fasting regularly, but otherwise you can fast if possible, uh, but avoid this, this Shabbat, the middle of Shabbat, that is uh, a bidah, to fast specifically on that day, thinking it is the night of Dikri, this is wrong. Uh, the other aspect is for sisters, and this is what we're going to cover, inshallah, in the, in the fiqh. Uh, for sisters who have missed their last Ramadan fasting. I will cover this in detail, of course, but I quickly just to answer the question. This is the last opportunity you have. You have to fast on this month of Shaman. You have to. Because there's further fasting which you missed last year. Likewise, brothers as well. Some brothers miss fasting for sickness or traveling, whatever, and they neglect it for the whole year. You have to fast before the Ramadan starts again. This is the last month, Shaban. This is your last opportunity. Time. Okay, so we'll see you inshallah next week, Yom Sabt, same time, um, 8.30 Saudi. And I'll upload this recording on the uh, on my YouTube channel and the playlist, a new playlist called uh, Ramadan 1445, inshallah. And you can access it there if you wish and also circulate it to get the ajar of uh, da'wah. Subhanaka Allah, hama wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa ilayk wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Wa anta khair. Jazakallah khair. Amin.